Welcome to Tough Conversations. I'm David Mears. I am the Executive Director of Audubon Vermont, which is the state office of the National Audubon Society. And I am excited to be joined by an impressive group of young conservation leaders who are joining us tonight to lead a discussion about what's been happening at the national level and what we might look forward to in the coming years and what are some strategies we could think about to address the many myriad of environmental challenges that face our country this year. That's my bird clock in the background. I apologize for that. Um, so, and I should know what that, Lewis, what is that? Is that a Carolina Wren? Yes. Um, sorry for that sidetrack. Uh, anyway, so mo most importantly, I wanted to just briefly describe the Tough Conversation series and why we've started these. And I'm going to turn off my video and turn it over to our two hosts, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But the Tough Conversations uh, series was started a little over a year ago and has been led by Audubon Vermont policy interns and, and others, uh, uh, other young people that are working with Audubon, uh, to lead conversations on some of the toughest and most difficult uh, environmental issues facing us, as they've included issues of environmental racism, uh, climate change, and today the kind of role of states and local governments versus the federal government. All tough issues, all incredibly relevant all issues that were in topics that were chosen by the, the policy interns and the questions and the, the format has all been selected by this group. And they have also selected a, a very talented group of panelists who I'm looking forward to hearing from. So with that, I'll just briefly introduce Sophia Benito Alston and Caroline Crowell, who are both uh, undergraduate students and they'll describe their respective institutions. But it's been a fantastic privilege to be able to work with them over the past few months on a number of issues in the state of Vermont addressing environmental policy. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Sophia and Caroline, and thank you so much. Thank you, David. Yeah, so my name is Sophia. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm currently a senior at the University of Vermont studying wildlife conservation, and I look at both the science and the policy behind that, and I am minoring in chemistry. Um, and my name is Caroline. I, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a sophomore at Barnard College in New York City. Um, but because of the remote nature of everything this semester, I've been able to um, work with Audubon Vermont, which has been an incredible experience. Um, I am majoring in political science and environmental sustainability, um, and I'm really interested in environmental policy. Um, yeah, so with that, I think we can kind of kick things off um, just to give a little bit of an overview of the evening. Um, we are going to be talking about um, the topic of federal rollbacks um, on environmental issues and um, rollback recovery. And that deals with a lot of different issues. We're going to try to touch on as many aspects of it as possible this evening. Um, and our goal is really just to challenge um, all of our viewers tonight um, to kind of think more critically about our federal system, um, about some of its shortcomings and what states can do um, and what we can all do on an individual level to um, kind of step in as environmental leaders. Um, we're going to hear from our incredible panelists about their experience seeing the harm of federal rollbacks um, and some of the successes um, that states have had in environmental protection as well as some examples of important environmental policies that our states are and should be exploring. Um, so as I said, there are a lot of topics that we wanna cover this evening and we want to be able to hear from the audience as much as possible. Um, so rather than having a big Q and A at the end, we are going to um, try to take questions throughout as they come up. So feel free to put any questions you have in the chat um, throughout the webinar and we will try to get to them um, as we can. Perfect, so yeah, we're gonna hear from our panelists now. We just wanna know what you're doing, you know, name, pronouns, um, and whatever really else you wanna add. Lewis, we're gonna start with you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Lewis Grove. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I grew up a birder in Central Pennsylvania. Um, and decided that a career playing with birds in the forest sounded like a really good idea. So biology major and spent a number of years working on uh, ornithology projects kind of all over the country. A lot of point counting, uh, a lot of nocturnal flight call research, hawk watching, um, various stuff. 
And uh, over time, it became more and more clear to me that the issues and conservation issues facing birds were not a matter of um, lack of knowledge or scientific knowledge, but uh, a lack of policy and will. Um, so a few years ago, I made the decision to transition to law, went to Vermont Law School, uh, which I graduated from last May. Um, I'm now a licensed attorney in Vermont working for the Department of Labor. Um, I had the great pleasure a couple, of summer, a couple of springs ago, rather, of working with Audubon as an intern, a policy intern, um, where I helped uh, lay some of the very early groundwork on Vermont's new Migratory Bird Protection Act, um, which was exactly uh, what we're talking about tonight, was uh, passed in the wake of some rollback federal level. So very excited to be part of the conversation. Kate, on to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kate Burdan. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm a current graduate student getting preparing for my defense next month here at the University of Vermont. Uh, I'm wrapping up a dual degree in environmental law and policy from Vermont Law School and a master's in natural resource management from UVM. Uh, my focus and my background is largely in the field of land conservation um, through land trusts. Uh, I am a huge outdoor recreationalist. I uh, love paddling, hiking, skiing, you know, anything that gets me out into the woods. And so uh, I, I'm really happy to have found a career where I can do that, talk to landowners, figure out those issues, uh, and focus on land use from both a local and a state level. Perfect, thank you so much. Chloe. Hi, I'm Chloe Kossaf. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and um, I am a policy analyst at the National Audubon Society on our climate team. I've been working with Audubon for almost four years now. Um, before that, my background was in environmental science, uh, and I grew up in California and, you know, love California, love everything about it, um, but have been out in DC um, kind of working on these uh, conservation issues, trying to kind of um, help push progress at a, at a federal level. Um, because similar to Lewis, I, I kind of learned early on that um, a lot of these changes aren't, aren't due to that lack of scientific knowledge, but more um, an ability to storytell and, and change people's minds about it. Um, and we were asked to maybe share a favorite bird. So I'll just share, um, I know missed opportunity for the other two. Uh, I love um, scarlet tanagers um, specifically because it's something that's really easy for me to tell the difference between the male and female, but I think both the male and female are really beautiful, bright birds. So um, that's a, a favorite of mine. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Mara. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining tonight and having me on. Um, my name is Mara, and I use she, her pronouns. And I am an artist and a naturalist, and I often work in the tradition of natural history illustration. Um, I got my start as the in-house botanical illustrator um, at the United States Botanic Garden in Washington, D.C. And I worked there for a couple years and then I wanted to, I grew up in Montana and I wanted to get back west and uh, be using like drawing as a way to literally draw attention to threatened landscapes. And uh, for the last couple years, I've been really lucky and have been able to do that work. And uh, over the course of two summers, I joined a friend of mine and um, an old professor who's a biologist and we've been um, ground truthing and uh, exploring my friend's home island, which is called Prince of White. Prince of Wales Island in Alaska. Um, and it's an area where uh, some of these rollbacks have had a really large impact. And um, I was invited to tell, to, to try and shed some light and tell the story of um, those threatened temperate rainforest communities in Southeast Alaska. Um, I actually got my start, the first uh, paid illustration job I did was with Montana Audubon, like almost a decade ago, which is kind of funny. And uh, the project I've been working on in Alaska is sponsored by Alaska Audubon. So, um, and I do love birds. I'd say my favorite is uh, the red-winged blackbird, mostly because it's call and um, little epaulets are just uh, something that I really remember from my childhood growing up here in Montana. Thank you all so much for your introductions. I'm very excited to keep hearing about all of this. Um, and if everyone is ready, I think we're gonna just jump right into 
what the federal rollbacks are. And specifically for our audience members um, who might not know what the rollbacks are or like why they were important. Um, during the Trump administration, different federal agencies tried to weaken and replace some of the rules that are designed to protect not only the environment, but our public health. And so these changes to our laws are seen as rollbacks. And unfortunately, under the Trump administration, we saw approximately 100 environmental policies that focused on clean air, water, wildlife, drilling, you know, toxic chemicals were rolled back. And more than a dozen more were actually kind of midway in the process of getting rolled back and are now kind of in limbo. Um, and so some of the examples of these laws include the Endangered Species Act. So now it's harder to list a species as endangered on the list. Um, they have finalized a plan to allow oil and gas drilling in Alaska. Um, there was a rollback on the Migratory Bird Act and the list goes on and on. Um, so we just wanna talk about why this is important and you know, what's next and how we all feel about it. And I'm kind of going to let our panelists take the lead if there's anything specific they want to say. Okay, <laughs> Lewis, Chloe, you both mentioned um, in your introductions that you didn't feel like there was a lack of science, but there was a lack of policy. Um, and that's why you both kind of ended up in this field. So what were your reactions when the rollbacks began during the Trump administration? Um, I mean, for me personally, of course, it was very demoralizing. Um, environmental progress is something that we have made slowly over time and over decades, and we inch forward a little bit at a time. Um, and to see it undone quickly um, over the course of a few years, so much of it undone, is, it's hard to watch, of course. Um, even more frustrating, I think, was the, the larger dynamic that kind of belied was this um, administrative agency kind of actions that kind of ping pong back and forth from administration to administration, where now we're going to spend a few years um, putting forth a lot of work just to get back to where we were, you know, um, just to get back to where we were, not making any more progress at all. Um, so that's the most, maybe the most frustrating part of the whole dynamic, is that kind of this log jam that we're, we're stuck in without some kind of broader legislative. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, I mean, we might have made way too sweeping of um, statements saying that there's not a lack of science, because I think we saw over the last four years a complete devaluation of science and decentering of it, and um, to a point where it was, it was kind of um, irrelevant to the decisions being made or cleverly hidden or disregarded. And um, I think, like, hopefully this is a moment where going forward we're we're thinking more about how to how to center both the science and the people, the career civil servants that are helping um, evaluate that and make those decisions. Because I think we've experienced over the last four years that um, we've taken a lot for granted in terms of um, what our government values, um, both people wise and uh, fact wise. Yeah, I think kind of going off of what you were saying of it's not necessarily like a lack of science. Um, I think another element is we saw 100 rollbacks under Trump, but it was in no way a Trump specific problem and it's in no way a Republican specific problem. Um, I think our system is set up in a really flawed way. And I think that's the biggest topic that needs to be addressed of does our system make sense? Does it make sense that it takes years to get a law passed in the first place and then such a little effort really to get them rolled back and eliminated? Yeah. I to you know, echo off of, of both of what Lewis and Chloe and Sophia, what you're saying, the, the timeline that you're working with between like science and policy is a tough one to start with even before the Trump administration rollbacks. Um, you know, a lot of the scientific research is decades in the making. Um, it's multiple studies. It takes a lot of resources, a lot of people power. Um, and then to then get the advocacy movement, get it on to a, like, the plate of some legislature leaders to really look at, figure out, and then get it passed or enacted. That's you know multiple more years. Um, and so while yeah, definitely the Trump administration was that demoralizing moment of oh this is an extreme side of this disconnect where it's setting us back even further. I mean this is something this is a disconnect that I think has been happening for a while and. Hopefully this is a moment because of this, these Trump administration rollbacks 
where this is a time to change and maybe figure out what is the way to connect science and policy in maybe maybe not speed it up because a lot of the science does take time, um, but a way where that feedback loop can happen in a more efficient way. I think that really gets at a kind of fascinating inherent inherent difficulty of this is that if you want to advocate for these things, we need to be making uh, strong emotive statements about what needs to happen, right? Um, but the problem is the science itself is is a, a realm of uncertainty. It's um, it's slow. It is you know, if you're doing good science, you're never out there hardly saying, I know for sure the answer is this. You know, it's, it's built on falsifiable hypotheses, not on, on grand statements about what is true. Um, and I think that advocacy kind of has to be built off of a, a different kind of take on it. So I think there's that inherent kind of tension behind uh, translating it anyway, that, that I think scientists, I know I struggled with it coming into the advocacy world. My nature was to be, Skeptic, a uh, to state very precisely and uh, what the findings were versus um, pushing people in with a motive argument. Gosh, yeah, you can even connect that to like the constant question in uh, conservation is, you know, how are we supposed supposed to protect things for perpetuity when nature is constantly changing? Like we can't plan for forever when we don't know what that looks like. Um, and it's that, it's that weird timeline of how, how flexible are we with the policies that we make? How often do we revisit them and say, oh, things have changed in this environment. And maybe this is something where we need to step this up, or maybe this is something where we can revisit. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a constant push back and forth, I think. Yeah, I think I think um, that that question of when do we reevaluate re is really important because one of the big rollbacks that we saw um, is a reexamination of the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA, um, as we as we love to call it. And um, you know, NEPA is kind of the best that we have right now, but it's 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 in, it's intentionally burdensome, right? And so you know, I'm betraying my environmental community and colleagues a little bit by saying that like it's something that bears uh, revisiting because it's actually going to slow the progress on some of the changes that we do need around um, you know big uh, infrastructure projects that are going to help decarbonize our transportation system and our um, renewable energy projects that are going to decarbonize our electricity system or even wildfire management that um, is is really um, affecting people in the west uh, but you know, it's the best we have. And so if we re-examine it, we, we leave it really vulnerable to attacks. And so we're kind of trying to strike this balance right now between, um, you know, do we do we let people touch it? Um, and it's it's really tempting to say no, even though we, we might need to, to to meet the scale of the moment. Do you feel like there'd be a good approach to revisiting some of these laws? Like, would there be a way to revisit laws without it being too susceptible to change? Or what are kind of your opinions on how we can improve our laws? I'll say from my experience, the politics are, are too skewed around this right now to, for me to feel as though people are approaching this in good faith on both sides. Um, so um, I think there would have to be kind of a reckoning with what, how we value our environment and our natural resources and our, our protections for them um, versus the interests of people who want to be able to get in and kind of exploit natural resources or, or do things quickly without really thinking through both the environment and the people impact. We really do need to start thinking about more, more about kind of how our projects are impacting people and, and especially vulnerable people. Definitely. Yeah, so I'd actually be curious to hear um, about that aspect um, from you, Mara, um, and how kind of your experience as a botanical illustrator um, allows you to kind of have a different perspective on how to make that connection um, to nature to have people see the value. Sure, I was thinking of a couple things as you guys were, were talking here. Um, first off, I just want to say something about science and um, science, science is relevant, of course, as we make our decisions, but I don't think that scientists are always the best storytellers and that science doesn't always speak to 
people on the level that convinces them that they want to engage in some sort of like political action. And, um, and that's why I think there's a need for, for stories. And, um, my, uh, my friend and collaborator in this film project called Understory, which was made over the course of really, uh, one summer, we took a boat, uh, called the Merlet named after a, a little bird that lives uh, to seabird and it's dependent on coastal temperate rainforests to make its nest because it's a bad flyer and when it comes in to nest it needs like the the overgrown moss that you see on the branches of these giant sitka spruces um, and other temperate rainforest species to to nest anyway so we so we took this trip and Elsa said that you know she's she's a fisherman she's uh, been making her living off of this landscape for um, now two generations in her family and knows the the sea uh, intimately. But uh, in order to understand what was happening on the ground, she felt that she needed to to put her boots on the ground and walk physically across the island to understand what was happening. And um, I, I just think there's something to be said about uh, getting out into these places and having your own experiences to then be better advocates for those so the, for those places and that um, you know I was certainly a visitor in the Tongass and I'm doing my best to um, tell my story as a as a visitor in this place and as a um, you know as an American citizen we have a unique model of public lands in the United States where we're all owners of these public spaces so my voice is is relevant in this conversation as much as Elsa who's you know lived there for two generations um yeah so I I think our film understory is a rallying call for people to uh, explore their backyards and understand and look closely at the changes that are happening around them. And that we don't need to go to um, the wildest parts of our country to, uh, to, to celebrate and to see what's, what's going on. Um, extraction is happening in the backyards of everyone. Uh, Prince of Wales Island, where we were um, visiting these last stands of temperate rainforests is also the island in Southeast Alaska that has been the hardest hit by the logging industry on public lands. Um, so it is the, the region with the highest density of clear cuts. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to recreate and think about like the, like when we're going to look for birds, um, using birds as an example, where do we often find them? We see them in the settling ponds of our, our urban sewage districts, you know? And I, I think that it's important to uh, draw attention to these industrialized uh, spaces around us and to not just uh, spend time in our kind of preserved na national parks and stuff, because those aren't the places that are threatened. It's the, it's the in-between places that need our attention. Yeah, definitely. I think that is a really great point, um, kind of bringing it home and allowing individuals um, or not allowing, but um, kind of encouraging individuals to um, see the beauty of and the value of nature um, everywhere because, you know, there are these incredible national parks throughout our country, but there's also beauty in, you know, a small park in a city um, and just throughout. And um, it's very important to kind of preserve all of that. Yeah. And that if you are already watching and in touch with what's around you, you'll be a better advocate for that space uh, when, when it is threatened. Um, I also wanted to just bring up that, and, and speak specifically to the rollback of the Tongass, um, the roadless roll on the Tongass National Forest. So the Tongass is our largest nas national forest. And um, during the Trump administration, one of the last things he did in office was uh, exempt the Tongass from the roadless rule, which has been in place since the Clinton administration. And as we move forward, I think people are thinking about, um, uh, you know, you guys are asking like, how, how can we rethink some of these environmental rules? And I think one opportunity is to advocate for more permanent protections of these threatened landscapes. And 
um, I have kind of a question for other folks. Uh, we are really challenged by the, um, you know, the Organic Act, which gives the um, USDA and the Forest Service the impetus to manage for multiple use. And I, I don't imagine that like multiple use will ever be, uh, I feel like multiple use is an important thing, but uh, what, ha like, is there a way to uh, think about multiple use so that one industry, one highly extractive industry um, doesn't impact the, the use for the rest of the users? Yeah, I mean, I just, this isn't a total answer to your question, but I do think it's something really fascinating with the Forest Service that it actually falls under um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, whereas most of the other public lands that we think of are um, managed under the Department of the Interior. And that was explicitly because they saw forests as a kind of crop um, when when the Forest Service was formed. And so that, that underlying framework of of seeing these forests as um, something to be harvested and managed with that in mind. Of course, there's an ability to shift, you know, evolve this over, over time, but ultimately like that is kind of the, the founding framework for, for how the Forest Service sees um, forests and, and stands of trees. Um, and so it's a tough question because it's in the DNA of the agency um, and will continue to be because it, because it falls under this, you know, agriculture department um, instead of kind of this these with these other public lands. Not to say that other public lands um, are free of the multiple use um, framework, and and others are managed that way. But I, I do think that that's a really important kind of starting point to think think about the Forest Service. So then, do you feel like it's we don't need to only revisit some of our laws, but our federal agencies and how we're structured? I mean, I, I think there's an ability to, um, we, can, we can change what the mission statement basically is of the, of the agency um, by writing new laws, but I don't know if it's possible to fully uh, extricate that DNA because I don't see it as something that ever moves um, out of USDA. So I don't know if it's, it's possible and I don't know if it's, necessary. You know, I, I think working forests are, we should have working forests, right? Like, you know, timber is a resource. I just think that like, there's a difference between working forests um, and the Tongass National Forest, um, which has some of the, you know, last remaining stands of old growth trees um, in this, what used to be, you know, an expansive timber rainforest. So maybe it's not about, um, you know, completely doing away with the multiple use um, but understanding uh, the difference between, or, or trying to better parse out the value of these different landscapes. Yeah, I think- To speak to value, um, there's sort of like hot, hot word in some of the scientific communities these days are ecosystem services. So um, what do ecosystems provide for us that are in some ways maybe unquantifiable. I mean, the peace you get from walking in the woods um, or the joy you get from like a sunny landscape of your favorite mountain or something like that. But some of them are more quantifiable. I mean, clean water that has been filtered through a wetland, that is something that once that wetland is bulldozed or gone, or like, let's say, you know, the Tongass National Forest, once that is gone, you know, what, what was the value of that? And I think that it's really tough because, you know, as, as somebody who loves nature just for the intrinsic value of it, you know, I, I want other people to be able to do that too. But at the end of the day, we are also sort of tied into a uh, industrial commercial world um, where these things do have value placed on them, but a lot of that value isn't necessarily realized because these ecosystem services have been taken for sort of granted for so long. Um, and so I think that's maybe one way that we can push some of these groups into the 
you know, into the future is to really start valuing these resources much higher than they have been in the past. Um, and of course, that's going to have, you know, an effect on industry, um, on the communities that are there, but figuring that out in a way that hopefully provides the most benefits for all while retaining that ecosystem service. Um, it's a really, it's a really interesting idea and I hope to see it play out more and more. Um, and there's been some really interesting experiments of payments for ecosystem services, especially in Latin America um, that I definitely, uh, I'll see if I can find some links and post them too, because they're really fascinating works to uh, support the communities and the environments there. I think that, I mean, I think the ideas around ecosystem services are fantastic too. I think that we should absolutely be valuing systems for what they provide to us. Um, but I think part of the problem with this whole framework, and as Chloe kind of hinted at with um, the forest being under the Department of Agriculture, is that a lot of this is anthropocentric. This, these things exist for us. You know, even ecosystem services, we're looking at these environments in terms of what they can provide to us, our society, and at, a, kind of at the end of the day, what's going to turn into a kind of a financial calculation. Um, and I think maybe part of the problem with, with these, and I, this is an imprecise answer, is let's get away from this sense of anthropocentrism to our public land. Think about, I mean, there are some federally designated lands that are for, for conservation purely, but to expand those, to think about far more set aside for just natural systems as they are. Um, and in the end, we're all gonna benefit from that anyway, of course. Uh, but whether it's parks or national forests, these all, I mean, all these things exist mostly for the benefit of humans. And that's understandable. We want these things, of course, but, um, the harder conservation issues going forward, I think we need to get away from the idea that all these lands serve us. Awesome. Um, and we have a few questions in the chat that are um, pretty interesting and relevant now. So um, I think we will take some of those. Um, the first one goes back a little bit um, to Mara's point about um, kind of allowing folks to appreciate um, the nature around them so that they can better become advocates. Um, and this question actually comes from my mom, um, hi mom. Um, and she wants to know um, how we can better connect disadvantaged youth to um, those who live in urban and to those who live in urban areas um, with nature so that they can become better advocates. So if anyone has any um, kind of thoughts on that or any experience they might have with um, kind of connecting those who might not have as easy a connection with nature. Um, I would say two, two things sort of like immediately pop into my mind. Um, and that is the awesome work that's like already being done in a lot of urban areas by youth groups and things like that, um, that are really just trying to focus on areas within the community already. So whether that's like small urban gardens, parks, waterfronts, um, places where kids can connect to nature and also feel a connection to their home. Um, and I think that's really important. I think a lot of times urban landscapes are sort of discounted as, as not being maybe like a real connection to nature or something like that. Um, but in fact, I think for a lot of people who grow up in urban areas, that's, that's maybe a starting place. Um, and, you know, the great you know, national parks, things like that are incredible, um, but they're not super accessible if you're in an urban area or you're below the poverty line. Um, and that is where I think the second point that I was thinking of comes in and a lot of it comes to funding. I think supporting groups that are focusing, focusing on environmental justice is just more important than ever. And at this point, really like most, all, all environmental organizations should be taking that into consideration as well when they're doing their work is how it is taking that interest pre, pre, uh, presented view, but saying, you know, how are we connecting all communities to nature? How are we reaching the disadvantaged folks in our area to make sure that our message applies to them as well? Yeah, I know. I can definitely speak to um, that point about urban areas maybe not seeming as upfront like they have nature, but they really do. Um, studying environmental studies in New York City, I was kind of skeptical going in, but I've had so many great classes um, pre-COVID. But um, 
you know, birding in the park and seeing some incredible birds that are right there in Manhattan and you wouldn't, you might not think it, um, but they're there um, and it's there. It's all about accessibility, absolutely. And so yeah. much of it, I think you don't have to like reinvent the wheel. I mean, I think every city that I've ever, you know, lived near or been in, there's groups that are doing this work. Um, just, you know, some have a harder time getting off the ground because it is, it is that question of resources. Yeah, I think that this uh, division that we make between like wild places and urban places is damaging. Um, I, I don't think that it exists. I think that it's actually all quite, quite connected and that it's the failure of our ability to like actually tell stories about nature. And if we are able to broaden that definition to include pigeons in urban areas or urban deer or <laughs> what um, it can speak to a larger audience and it also speaks to the resilience um, of nature and I actually find it um, kind of damaging when we uh, we place this hierarchy on like on what types of nature experiences are better or or yeah we we make a hierarchy of that and um, I I think if we look at the weeds grow the weeds growing in the cracks in the sidewalk that it says something about the resiliency of life and it would be a shame to um, to to like not include that in our definition of like what is an experience with nature. I will just add that I think we also do need to acknowledge that like there is a very intentional way that a lot of our cities were built where more affluent. Uh, areas have better access. You know, I, I live in Washington, DC. I live right near Rock Creek Park, which is this incredible um, urban park that goes right through the Northwest part of the city, but not everybody in the in the city has the same kind of access to a space like that. And, and we just, you know, there's, there's people that have done mapping across many cities that can basically tie the um, income level or the price of housing to um, green space and tree cover. So there's also a lot of work that we need to do to undo that um, and invest in communities without kind of um, causing gentrification also by by um, adding greenery. So that's an investment that we can that we can make too. Um, and and I'll say that um, also just kind of doing a better job of tying the environment to our health um, and understanding like one of the reasons that we should care about the environment is because it's it's so linked to um, our, our health. And so having um, more you know, tree cover in cities means that you're not gonna be as um, exposed to heat in the summers and you're gonna be able to better withstand that. Um, having healthy wetlands means that your river is gonna be less polluted. Um, having you know, more uh, plant life means that your air is gonna be cleaner. So just understanding that um, you know, there are all these amazing inherent things about nature. Birds are beautiful and birds travel through our cities, but also it's, you know, it is so entwined in our, in our person, in our health as well. I think it's a, a really important role for, for art too, right, Mara? I mean, bringing nature to people, all of these things are kind of collective action problems that just on a global scale. And it can't just be about protecting the park down the street or the forest over the hill. Um, especially with migratory birds, you know, we're talking about hemisphere spanning population. Um, and so we have to care about places that are far flung that we're never going to see also, uh, we're going to protect these kinds of things. And I think for as much as I agree that getting people out into places and exploring the neighborhoods that they're in, those things are fantastic and we should, can't do enough of that, sure. But I think bringing, bringing nature and images found and media to people too that evoke emotions about faraway places obviously a key part of this always has been needs to be also forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, yeah, this has been a great conversation um, about, yeah, what we can do at all different kind of community levels um, to bring nature kind of into the conversation, um, allow everybody to be better advocates. 
Um, so now I think just shifting gears a little bit, I'd love to talk about um, some of the examples um, that we have seen in states um, kind of as environmental leaders. Um, so for example, Lewis, um, I know you worked in Vermont um, on some work with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, could you speak a little bit first about just what that is um, and then kind of why that work is important, why it's important for states to um, take action like that? Yeah, sure. The uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act as probably a lot of our audience knows, um, it's one of our nation's earliest bedrock environmental protection laws. It's more than 100 years old now. Um, and it was passed in response to declining populations of birds all around. A lot of uh, herons and egrets, of course, were some of the major uh, impetus for it. Um, and essentially, it's a law that has been long interpreted by courts and executive branch for, for decades now to apply to prohibit actions wherein you cause damage to a bird population, even if that wasn't the purpose of your activity. So, for instance, a lot of the biggest finds under the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf years ago came under Migratory Bird Treaty Act for all of the birds that were oiled, the habitat that were hurt. Um, so it's it's been a it's a, it's a very kind of broad-reaching uh, law, and uh, so one of the rollbacks under under the administ previous administration was to remove. Um, this blanket effect of it um, to, to basically require an intent requirement. So that actions, if, you're, if your purpose is not to hurt a bird and you do hurt one incidentally, you would no longer be uh, covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. That was an essential rollback that occurred, which uh, basically would take all entirely the teeth from this, this um, really important bill, uh, whether it's oil spills or forestry or whatever the, the various things that have been um, covered under this law. Uh, so what we did in Vermont was we essentially we sought to just kind of very precisely replace that protection in Vermont to, to spell out. Um, after that protection no longer exists at the federal level, we, we know that Vermont is, can be a receptive and states can be much more flexible and fast moving about this kind of stuff often. Um, and so uh, I had the really the great pleasure to be on the initial part of the groundwork to start to lay the, the tracks for that bill to go. And, um, about a paragraph long we passed in Vermont, it's not much to it. Um, it just specifies really simply that that any acts that hurt birds that are foreseeable um, consequences of, of your actions are now prohibited in Vermont. So essentially we just, you know, filled in the gap that was there at the state level uh, for something that was rolled back at the federal level. And obviously that's an important thing. And some other states have done similar things. And some already had things on the book that were like that. Um, but ultimately, of course, as good as it was and as good as I'm happy as I am that birds in Vermont are protected in that way, a patchwork state by state system of this kind of stuff for migratory birds is only ever going to be so effective you know, um, without a broader regional or hemisphere really level um, guiding policy framework for this. You know, I, it's not, not going to mean that much. As much as I, as much as I think these things are important, and I think they should do them without, without hesitation, uh, it really was was a poor replacement for the federal. Chloe, I'm curious um, what your perspective from um, kind of the DC national level is on that, um, and just how effective states can be. Um, do you agree that we really do need it to be kind of a national thing? Um, I think states are, I think the states are really important in being able to show proof of concept. Um, you know, it's much easier to work at a state level to pass a really good bill and show its benefits um, than it is than to work through the political machine in DC, um, which, often spits out something that is not exactly some kind of Frankenstein that, you know, you didn't plan on. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really amazing that Vermont was able to fill that gap. Unfortunately, it doesn't protect against leakage, right? So if somebody wants to do something in, in Vermont um, and now, that, you know, they know that they'll be liable under Vermont's um, strengthened MBTA, they may go next door um, to New Hampshire and do it there instead. So there's, there's a role for 
states to, to lead um, to kind of maybe once things are up and running, show that um, the, the consequences that the detractors were arguing were going to happen don't and, and, you know, show that it really does bring benefits. But um, at some point that has to be scaled back up to, to, fill, to fill those gaps at a, at a national level, especially when we're talking about something that crosses state borders, not in, you know, international borders, um, like, like birds or pollution. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point about the proof of concept. And, and I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, uh, was really important. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning too, that, you know, the more states that do this, the more momentum builds. This is collective action problems are so tough because we all have to lead together, right? Um, and what, what game theory research and all that kind of stuff seems to show is that the more small steps that individual actors take or make agreements amongst themselves, the more that builds momentum for larger agreements down the road. So I think every little bit obviously helps and builds that momentum. Um, but I think the leakage point is exactly, exactly correct that abortion is for migratory birds is more than most. It's good to hear you both say that um, because uh, some of my own research has been very focused on the green burial movement. Um, and that's, that's an environmental movement that has been really working state by state to try and change state legislation um, and is now finally at the point where there is potentially enough momentum to start talking about what federal legislation would look like to enable green burial throughout the United States. Um, and it's a slow, it's a slow process and it's going to look, it definitely looks like a Frankenstein right now because it's only a handful of states. Um, they each have different, you know, standards and regulations for this. Uh, Vermont uh, legalized green burial a few years back, but then had to redo it because the burial depth was incorrect. So it's going to be a lot of trial and error for anything that's starting from that state level. Um, but I think it's a great it's a great place for that proof of concept, for that growing ground um, to create legislation that will hold up when you bring it to DC too. Yeah, and I, this is this is slightly different, but you know, California has a has a waiver under the Clean Air Act um, that allows them to set more stringent uh, uh, miles per gallon kind of requirements for vehicles, and and California is a really big state. Um, the, you know, and has a lot of market power, but them being able to 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 have power outside of the federal government allows them to to pull progress forward. Um, unfortunately, I think we also see that there are um, we can see the reverse with this, and there are groups like ALEC, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council, that will write bad model bills, and and states can adopt them really quickly too, um, and create kind of a, a a strong enough pull in the other direction. So um, I think that's another one of the dangers of this kind of um, patchwork approach is that um, it works both ways. And, um, you know, that's, that's disappointing. <laughs> um, Kate, I'm sorry, could you quickly explain what green burial is and a little background on it? Yes. Um, so the green burial movement is uh, a push for more environmentally friendly burial practices. Um, so sort of your standard burial these days involves um, embalming, um, a non-biodegradable casket is sealed in a concrete vault um, with intensive landscaping um, and a lot of resources involved in it. Um, and so this is a movement that uh, I find personally fascinating because it's very entwined with religion and spirituality, cultural customs. Um, and it, it's pushing to offer more after death care options. So not saying, you know, this is the best one because depending on your own personal beliefs, maybe it isn't for you, but uh, trying to provide an option that isn't a very expensive, very resource intensive standard burial or a more affordable, but also uh, very much just as resource intensive cremation option for folks out there who are interested in a, what is, they consider a more natural burial to return to her. So no embalming, uh, biodegradable shroud or casket, 
no need for uh, the concrete vault because you aren't constantly mowing the lawn above. Um, and my focus has been really on conservation burial grounds, which are essentially nature preserves where you can be buried. Um, and then just kind of quickly going back to what we were saying about patchwork and states filling in, it's clearly just it, it, not the most efficient way, but do you feel like if solely more states adopted the same policies such as the MBTA, um, it would eventually lead to an encouragement for our federal law to do it? Just because right now patchwork is really all we have. Unfortunately, our federal law is too slow and these laws have been rolled back. So then isn't patchwork going to eventually encourage our federal government to do more? I mean, I think that's, that's where our, our role comes in as advocates, right? You have to make a case um, to, to uh, you know, people that represent all 50 states um, that this is something that's worth passing. And I think, um, you know, starting with the states shows that it can be done. And I think it was really helpful because um, especially over the last four years, we still saw progress in states, even states that um, we think of as super conservative took action on the environment and on climate change um, and not always at the scale or the speed that we needed, but it was an opportunity to still kind of be working at that proof of concept um, at the state level um, in all these kind of different labs, um, doing different things. So, you know, it, it has, it's going to have to reach the, the federal level at some point. And, but, but that's the work that we have to do as, as citizens, right? That's, you know, we have to pressure our elected officials to take these things seriously. Um, otherwise they won't. Um, so being able to tell those stories about, about, the success in states is is really really as vital as as passing the laws in the first place. Yeah, I just feel like I, I vote anytime I can, whether it's for Burlington or Vermont or the country. Um, but I know that I feel like my voice is more heard when it's something more local and you know just statewide. And I feel like if more people realize that by voting in these like local elections and getting these MBTA like small laws that happen in the state, that can lead to a federal thing. Like I. I do want to still provide a little optimism to people because that's what the optimism that I have because I get overwhelmed by everything that's happening and the rollbacks were such a heartbreaking thing to occur when I was just starting my career in this field. Um, I think seeing that our states can make these little moments, I know that they're not enough, but there's something like there's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I would say you're a better citizen than most that you're engaged on local issues. I, I made it my um, my New Year's resolution this year actually to get more engaged on local DC city council, um, you know, issues around the way that we uh, manage our energy and environment because it's so easy to pay attention to the national politics um, instead of thinking about what we can do locally. But I, I will also say that I think we forget that there, you know, between the elections every two years, there's so much time that we should be engaging our members of Congress. You know, I, that's something that before I lived in DC, I had never did, but that's, that's what they're there for. Um, you need to, you know, we should be reaching out to them. You can get in their office, like they have, you know, their staff has to talk to you. Um, and you can be making this a priority for them, making them a champion. Even if you have, you know, my representative in California has been the representative my entire life. Um, she's my political party. Um, but it doesn't mean she champions my issues. And that's something that I could have done much better getting, you know, talking to her staff all the time and with, with a group like a local Audubon chapter or whatever it may be to be making the case for why she needs to be championing that issue. Um, so I think we can't just expect politics to happen every two years around an election. It, there's, there's constant pressure that we can be applying to um, our elected leaders um, to, to just get them further, even if they're already good on something. Yeah, Chloe, you mentioned um, the importance of kind of making a case um, for something to be important to prove that, you know, we do need our elected officials to um, champion a certain um, policy or a certain field. And that kind of made me think of Mara's, Mara's film, um, Understory, and how um, that kind of 
unique route of using art to kind of make the case. Um, and Mara, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to your perspective on that and how um, that film and just um, art in general can be used um, kind of as a gateway into getting folks more engaged um, and maybe specifically in Alaska um, and how the rule box um, and the rule rule act um, kind of had that impact on people. Sure thing. So my friend Elsa, who's a fisherman and uh, grew up in Point Baker, realized that she wasn't going to be a very good advocate for the Tongass National Forest unless she had a good story to tell. And so in 2017, she invited me and my other friend to join her on this bushwhack across her home island. And after that, we totally had a story to tell. But, um, you know, I'm a botanical illustrator. Elsa is an advocate, Natalie's a biologist, and we felt like we needed, um, we thought that filmmaking would be the best media to bring the story to a larger audience and um, worked with uh, the director Colin Ayersman and his media production company to uh, produce this film understory, which uh, we'll drop a link in the chat here and folks can sign up. There's gonna be some free screenings of that film later. Uh, this month and just wanted to throw it out. It's like, uh, there's many ways to tell stories. Like this film was one way to meet a, a large audience and, and kind of get the Tongass on the map. We thought of um, how like the Bears Ears in Southeast Utah or the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, that these are, these are landscapes that um, have been captured in the American mind because of these advocacy movements uh, to protect large pieces of public land and there's stories wrapped up in there and and so our goal with um, the last stands project which is you know us as three women uh, ground truthing in this place and the film understory and uh, the series of paintings that I've been working on which are a collection of 10 paintings showing objects that I uh, collected, found during my time on the ground and they're uh, organized by color as a way to uh, kind of make a portrait of this place. Um, that that these, these, these ways of storytelling is just a way to help people connect to these public lands who don't necessarily like live or have the opportunity to visit them. And that, you know, people have the this the ability to do that with landscapes in their own backyards and I'll just say too uh and as we're reimagining like how to get to more permanent protection for some of these uh big pieces of public landscape that uh, we're also thinking about other local stakeholders. So these, these places are, are federal lands, um, but we also have within the United States, many sovereign tribal nations. And there are some exciting new models, I think for uh, managing public lands that involve local stakeholders in the form of like tribal consultation and even co-management. Um, in my own backyard here in Montana, the National Bison Range uh, was just repatriated to the Salish Kootenai tribe. It's like a totally new model for um, conservation in the West, I think. Uh, and I'm inspired by uh, and hopeful having Deb Holland as our new Secretary of Interior. And then I also wanted to just bring it back to the Tongass and say that, you know, after the uh, rollback of the roadless rule, um, 11 tribal nations uh, came together to, uh, excuse me, 11 tribes, not all of them are recognized as sovereign nations, um, have come together to uh, promote this co-management of the Tongass National Forest. So I'm excited about uh, tribal co-management as a uh, potential like new model for conserving landscapes in um, our public, our public system. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that is such an important piece of the conversation, um, getting folks to, and this is actually a question that we have from the audience um, that I want to tie in here is, um, how do we get people from far away places um, to kind of 
have a tie um, to that. And I think that your film kind of does a great job of that. Um, but is it relevant um, that there are indigenous, indigenous communities with deep ties to those forests? Um, and how can we be lifting up their stories? Um, so I think you did kind of just address that question just now, but I'd be curious to hear if anybody has any um, thoughts on how we can kind of tie those communities in, um, kind of lift up indigenous voices um, in these conversations. I know at least a, a starting place is always, of course, just reaching out to have that conversation here in the Northeast. Um, I think so many people view indigenous communities as no longer here. They've, you know, been forcibly relocated or dispersed or um, not being seen as having a community foundation here anymore. Um, and that's just not true. Uh, so recognizing that having or you know, like if you are part of an environmental organization, making sure that that environmental organization is educating itself on what those lands were and uh, whose lands they, they were and are. Um, and so like, there's so many different things to do, but just having that starting point of reaching out, providing that resource of maybe a space to have that conversation and taking those first steps yourself of educating you yourself and your group so that that isn't on them um, is a huge, huge like place to start. Um, I think focusing a little bit on Tongas, just because it is, you know, we have you, Mari, here with so much experience, and um, it is one of the largest national parks in the U.S. I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit to ecosystem services and to natural climate solutions, because I feel like these are two topics that um, the audience should know a little bit more about, and that I think you can all speak a little more in detail about um, Tongas, because it's temperate forest is often compared to the Amazon forest and it is an incredibly valuable piece of land not only for its intrinsic value and how beautiful it is and the clear cut um and like the old forest but what the forest itself provides um and I was hoping you could potentially speak on that yeah um so when you like step off you your skiff and make your way into the you know, there's no trails there. There's plenty of logging roads, but there's no trail. So when we were um, bushwhacking or backpacking, we were bushwhacking across this landscape and we walked through everything from, you know, really old clear cuts, uh, scary dogwood forests to uh, the spectacular old growth. And the, the forests that haven't been cut are are incredible. It's, you're kind of just met with this wall of vegetation, which you have to like crawl through and you've got huckleberries and um, maples and and then when you come into the open forest it's just like pillows of sphagnum moss that will sink like a foot and um, it's biomass um, it's tons of biomass and that is what carbon storage is right and so when we think of uh, these landscapes that uh, actually retain carbon for like centuries, it's temperate rainforests. And uh, the Tongass uh, as an uncut forest is uh, a great way to just keep carbon out of our atmosphere and to actively be uh, storing that, that carbon. So uh, one way to frame the, one of the reasons that we should protect the Tongass and keep uh, more of that landscape in its uh, you know, preserved, uncut state is that it uh, captures, uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember the math, but it's an incredible amount. And uh, by, by losing that, we're losing our planet's ability to um, adapt to climate change. Um, kind of working off of that, we do have questions from the audience. One is specifically for Kate and then one for Chloe, but obviously we welcome everyone to speak. First is, can multiple use more explicitly include ecosystem services, specifically carbon capture? Um, and then to Chloe's point about the forest service, do you think there's an opportunity to expand the definition of working forest 
to include carbon sequestration? And I can repeat the questions if you need me to. <laughs> Could you repeat that question for me? Um, can multiple use more explicitly include ecosystem services, specifically carbon capture? Um, so I, I just wanna be clear, the, the ecosystem services, I mean, they're there, whether or not we recognize them or not. Payments for ecosystem services is this novel idea of, um, you know, potentially paying communities to protect um, and improve on or continue to conserve those ecosystem services um, or as a form of compensation for damaging them. Um, and I think that that in, in so many of these places, it is a steeply entwined in mul uh, a multi-use landscape management. So um, just like off the uh, top of my head, some of these uh, payment for ecosystem services plans that have worked in Latin America, um, they are compensating fishermen for specifically catching, you know, lower catches. So they're, they're protecting their reefs, they're protecting the communities that are there, and they're actually promoting ecotourism by doing that, um, while also sustaining the livelihood of these fishermen who are part of the community. Um, and it's, it's a very like complicated, deep network of recognizing these like the intrinsic value of both of nature, but also the monetary value of it, and then bringing in some development and some commercial fishing, um, but finding the balance between all of that. Um, and ideally, payments for ecosystem services has largely only been sort of successful on these smaller regional scales. Um, and I think that's where it kind of works the best. Um, we definitely are starting to see that pick up more with carbon credits. That is a form of payments for, eco payments for ecosystem services that's focusing just on that one ecosystem service um, that forests provide. Um, but to take a more holistic view, I think would be both an economic and environmental feat that would take a long time, but I there are people out there working on this kind of thing, and it's it's really exciting to think about what that would look like. Thank you. Um, and then Chloe, the question for you was, do you think there's an opportunity to expand the definition of working forests to include carbon sequestration? Um, yes, but I think we have to be careful about that. Um, there's a difference between a forest that is designed to uh, sequester as much carbon as quickly as possible and a healthy forest. Um, and so you can, you can plant a bunch of fast growing trees that are um, basically, you know, in a, in a, a grid um, to suck up carbon really quickly. Um, a real healthy forest is something that has structural diversity, um, you know, species diversity, there's gaps in the, in the canopy, there's different kinds of, um, you know, there's, it creates bird habitat, there's other animal habitat, there's, there's stuff, um, you know, on the forest floor, um, there's deep soils, like, you know, it's, it's um, having like a, a real forest um, that, in, that embodies all that is going to sequester a lot of carbon, but there's a way in which when you're managing for carbon sequestration, you can get the former, which is a, a tree plantation, right? Um, so I think when we think about finding ways to incentivize or um, have multiple use that it takes carbon into account, we have to build in all these other safeguards where we're protecting the ecological integrity of the forest that we're talking about. We're protecting its ability to provide wildlife habitat, to provide all these other ecosystem services like water filtration, um, and that you know we can that we're continuing to manage it, but not in a way that is gonna, um, you know, create clear cuts. Um, that's gonna t selectively target you know certain trees. Um, so all to say that like I think that this is the direction we should be moving. Um, towards thinking about carbon sequestration, but 
taking into account everything that we know about um, what, what a healthy forest actually is um, for, for wildlife and for the ecosystem services that it provides to. Can I just add to that really quick, just to say that, you know, forest landscapes are very different, like the forests in the West, in Montana, California, which are fire adapted, that's, that carbon cycle is very different from a landscape like the Tongass, where the oldest trees uh, are 800 years old. And so logging in a landscape where, you know, trees are adapted to a fire regime where they might be uh, turning over every 100 years is very different than uh, you can think about logging or extracting carbon on a uh, old growth cycle as mining, right? You're, you're, you're extracting something that's taken thousands of years to, to come to maturity. Yeah, and I, I, sorry, <laughs> Lewis, I'll let you jump in in a second. Um, I, I think that that's something important is like understanding that those old growth trees aren't, are never going to be worth the, the um, kind of that, that carbon debt, right? And so um, if we're managing for carbon, that, that, that puts the thumb on the scale of, of conserving these old growth forests, um, because we're understanding that like, beyond all the other values they give, the, the trade-off in carbon will never be worth it. I just want to play uh, devil's advocate kind of for a second. I think, I think all this is important. I think that sequestering carbon is important. I think all that um, fishing, fishing less is important. I think, um, but I think that we're kind of putting the burden upon these natural systems to make up for our own sort of transgression. Uh, the way to Oh, not overfish things is to eat less fish. You know, the way to not need to sequester carbon is to use less carbon, to have less energy intensive lifestyle. You know, um, I see a lot of amazing solutions around climate these days. Um, I don't see a lot of discussion around things like really making meat cost what it should cost, or large houses not as um, tempting or you know, cost effective. Um, I think I think that I think these are all great solutions, but I'm not trying to poop on any any, any of any, these ideas at all. I just would love to see us put the burden on ourselves some to not be looking to nature to solve these problems for us. Um, you know. Yeah, I really just to tie it back to. Oh, sorry. So no, I was going to say you kind of your like finishing sentence was exactly what I wanted to add. Of we're just we hurt nature, but now we're expecting nature to repair itself, and we're willing to like maybe invest some more money in allowing that to happen, but we're not actually changing any of our ways of existing. And we're not willing to like invest in more renewable energy and stop using non-renewable energy. We're really not willing to make the shifts that we need to make so that nature can continue to sequester carbon and continue to be a storage, but like at a much more natural pace, not the way we think that we, it's just gonna counteract everything we're doing. And that's just not the point of it. Like. Yes, we should be investing in it. Yes, natural climate solutions are a fantastic option, but they should not be the only option. And many people are seeing it as such. Um, I think this, this is where it ties back to the importance of these federal laws. Um, individual consumer actions are, are super powerful, um, but at the end of the day, if we really want to stop you know, mega corporations, small individual actions, you know, if we could get them to be large enough, that would be amazing. But at this point, the biggest weapon that we kind of have in our toolbox is using the federal government to enact regulations on these corporations, on these, you know, massive industrial groups. Um, and so it's, it's a mix of everything. We have to do you doing it all, which is daunting. Um, but I think at the end of the day is somewhere that we are, are moving and maybe not fast enough, but hopefully picking up pace. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly correct. I think that maybe the frustrating part about it is that um, the very folks, you know, the, the connection between wealth and energy consumption, so, so um, universal across our country, across other countries, right there. Um, and unfortunately, those are exactly the same people that have political power in our that um, the wealthier you are, the more power you have to um, that speech, of course, that we don't have. Um, and 
So I think I think I agree 100 percent the system needs to change. Um, it seems like this intractable problem in some ways. So um, I think we need individual action and collective action. Um, someone wanted to know, someone asked, um, on all your thoughts on the potential conflict between development of clean energy and land preservation. An example is large scale solar panels and um, sites. Um, this is a topic I feel very passionately about. I don't think that there ever needs to be a conflict. Um, we have so much land in the US for projects like large scale solar developments, um, you know, if done correctly with consideration to the land, you know, we're not talking about cutting down forests to build these solar developments. We're talking about already unused agricultural land, open desert, you know, places where when, if an ecological impact assessment does deem that this is a feasible place, um, doesn't have to impede on the conservation values that are there. I'd and that's to, specifically for solar. Yeah, I'll, I'll push back a little bit. I think um, I think you're you're right to some degree, certainly. But the estimates I've seen are something like ten percent of our country is solar to replace all of our energy needs. Some huge numbers, right? Um, and I would argue that things like unused farmland and grasslands are some of our already the most imperiled habitats we have in this. Uh, they've already declined tremendously. And again, our solution is to further burden these natural communities to absolve ourselves of our own problems, you know? Um, I, think, I think it's obviously part of the solution. You know, I, I'm not saying solar is not part of the solution, certainly, and I, I love to think that there are ways to balance those things. Um, but I, I feel like we, we're looking at these things as though they're, they're silver bullets and we don't have to change anything ourselves about the way we live our lives. Um, and I'm just not sure that that's true. I think ultimately we're gonna see natural communities continue to even be more degraded or degraded, even if we build out large scale renewable, whether it's ground we think is not valuable or, or whatever, deserts are amazing. And uh, I think we should think twice about um, ambitious solutions that use large amounts of land. Yeah, I wanna play devil's advocate too. And I think about um, wind power and wind turbines. And there was this one specific case here in Vermont where there were some wind turbines that were being set up and they realized that a lot of bats were crashing into them. And unfortunately our bat populations throughout the country are very weak because of white nose syndrome. And so we were trying to address that problem. And so they spent millions of dollars on creating this little machine that would kind of create a radio frequency that these bats would hear. It turns out that only a specific species of bats could hear it. So then the other like six or seven that were living in Vermont were still crashing into wind turbines. And so sometimes we take a step forward and it's fantastic that we had these wind turbines, but then they were still really damaging um, our wildlife populations. And I know that non-renewable energy such as oil and gas is obviously incredibly harmful in so many other ways, but I agree sometimes like large scale projects are just as damaging and I don't really know what the midway solution would be, but there's pros and cons to both. I think it's tough because this is like we were talking about, you know, before we joined this discussion, this all comes back to that, that constant question of urgency. I mean, we're heading for an energy crisis. And so where, you know, how much do we push? What do we, what do we do both in, individually to reduce our consumption and also to replace um, these fossil fuels that we're using. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's finding that balance. But what that really means is that there are like winners and losers in every situation. Um, and that's really, it's really hard when, you know, we as people are both fighting for, you know, clean energy, environmental justice, you know, a, work, a living wage, things like that, but also trying to protect this intrinsic value of the nature around us um which i i want to say like we can get to the point where they're not constantly at odds um and we're not there yet but the fact that we're having these conversations is is the way to get there absolutely and i think that um all of that kind of ties into the importance of local engagement um and the potential for 
um, that collective local action to kind of drive um, more of an impact. So, um, you know, you look at the effects and that could be positive or negative. You look at um, maybe nimbyism with solar projects um, and maybe the harm of that, or you can see the positives of local communities coming up with um, a balanced land use plan. Um, and so I think it all just kind of does tie back to that. Um, if we can take those actions on a smaller scale um, and it can kind of um, trickle up, I guess, to the federal level. Um, that, that said, I, 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 don't, I don't think this is um, black and white. Um, you know, there's, there's, there are good renewables projects and, and really bad ones, um, or there are ones that at least minimize their harm and ones that are, that don't. Um, and so, you know, there, there is some work that, and this is one of those things that I was talking about as far as, you know, I think we recognize that despite the fact that renewables are not a perfect solution because they are, um, you know, intensive as far as land use, they do require, um, you know, the extraction of some minerals to be able to, to actually build them. They are better because they're not, you're not um, mining, you're not moving those resources across the country in pipelines or on trains, you're not burning them in a way that's creating local air pollution issues. So ultimately, um, as far as kind of their environmental impact, you know, we think that they're going to be net better, but there's still some, some thinking to be done around how do you actually minimize what, what the impact is? And so, you know, there has been some work in the California desert, for instance, to actually draw circles where um, putting solar energy would be um, less, in, you know, less detrimental to the landscape because there are desert tortoise, there are um, birds that, that use that landscape. Um, and so having a stakeholder process where you're bringing in conservation and wildlife groups, where you're bringing in indigenous groups, where you're bringing in, um, you know, local groups to kind of actually understand um, the landscape and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, focus development into these areas where it's least intensive um, is a process that should be repeated over and over again um, so that we can, when it's time to actually quickly roll these things out, um, we can do it and, and we're, we're more sure that we're minimizing that harm. So, so I think that there's, you know, it's not going to be perfect. We are going to, unfortunately, as conservationists, we have to kind of swallow that there's going to be some inherent development um, that comes with with solving this problem. Um, but it can be done in a way that's that's intentional, that that um, takes people's feedback into account, um, and and minimizes harm, if not completely avoids it, because we just can't at this point. We're we're on a moving train. I think that I think, I think that's exactly true. That there's balance to be thoughtful about where we do these things. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that it lends itself in India. So there's communities that don't want these things. The only ones that have the resources to fight back are the ones that already. Right. I think about the our economy and our society is a growing balloon, right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and push back to one place or another, but it's going to grow somewhere else instead. It's going to grow over somebody that have the power to ever fight back because they've been disenfranchised for so long, right? Um, so I, I, I think that it can be done thoughtfully. Um, I think that equity and justice are really tricky parts of talking about that kind of stuff so to where these go. Yeah, we seem to be living in such an exciting time where these conversations are ha happening. And I feel like, especially after this year that people are recognizing that the same models that have led to uh, the type of environmental uh, problems that we have today are not gonna be the models that we use to move out of these issues. So uh, yeah, we're talking about like uh, really complicated systems. And I, I just feel um, kind of hopeful and optimistic that, um, but determined that we don't continue to use the same models where it's the same winners coming out at the, the, the end of these, these things that, um, that we, we use a different model and we have more winners than losers. And uh, I, I just 
thought of that when you were saying, Kate, like we have winners and losers here. And it seems to me that we've had the same winners for, um, for centuries and uh, it would be nice to reevaluate who wins and who loses. Absolutely. Well, um, we are kind of getting to the end of our evening here. Um, so kind of to extend the conversation and wrap it up um, for this evening. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different topics. Um, so maybe if we could just kind of quickly um, sum it all up in kind of what ways you all think um, are some of the most effective ways that everyday activists um, and members of Audubon, um, folks who might be listening in this evening um, can work to stay engaged um, in their communities and encourage action um, from their states, um, from their leaders. Um, I'd love to just jump in here and um, I ask, like, I think that joy has to be part of this. And um, I just wanted to share and encourage everyone that, that um, you know, I really believe in the power of simple democratic tools like pens and paper and that we all have, you know, five senses in which to observe and uh, experience the world around us. And I think nature needs more advocates and um, I teach nature journaling workshops and uh, I feel like uh, being in touch with your local landscape is more relevant now than ever. And I just encourage people to maybe take up the daily practice. Maybe documenting isn't part of that, but it could just be noticing the color of the sky every single day or um, noticing who's, who's you know growing in your backyard, who's who's flying around uh, your house or the tree that grows outside of your window. And I feel like the pandemic certainly made people more aware of their local landscape, but um, I just, I, I, I think that any way that you can to pay attention, that that attention is, is poetic and, and meaningful. Yeah, Mara, I think that's, that's beautiful. And I, I just wanna echo that because I, I think also in this past year, you know, there has been so much just despair and uncertainty. Um, and, you know, being able to recognize that and still find joy in those small things of whether, you know, it's gardening or watching birds. Um, and, you know, when we are all able to like come back together as a community again, um, still bringing those small things and not leaving them behind as like, oh, well that was, you know, COVID times, just bringing that, bringing that intensity and those small joys with us as we then go back out into the world. Um, that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, yeah, I just want to thank my panelists for the conversation. I had a great, um, it kind of comes back to me for the old axiom of, of think globally, act locally, right? Kind of. 70s environmentalism, right? Um, expose yourself to the world in a through art and media and all this wonderful stuff to, to get a broader sense of your role in a bigger, wonderful mess that we're in. Um, but I think that it's demoralizing too. Like we've been saying tonight, there's a it's it's hard to believe. You know, if you pack your whole life to, well, I'm going to pass a federal bill that's going to save birds. You know, um, chances are you're going to be disappointed. Uh, I hate to say it, but but if you if your goal is to pass one in your local town, you know that's something that you can get done. That's something that you can feel good about. It's going to fill you up. It's going to help your soul. Um, and so, as much as you know, think or act locally is about getting something done. It's also about being good for yourself. Um, so I think that's a really good on a personal, but also a community level. Um, and I'll just note my favorite bird is black cat. Mine is the loon. <laughs> Um, and I'll just I'll just say um, uh, as a as a last uh, uh, thought, um, I just want to reiterate that like you know the political cycle is not once every two years. It it happens all the time. And and just because uh, you think so, just because somebody shares your party doesn't mean that they um, share your values. So there's always an opportunity to um, kind of 
be pushing for the things that you care about and make it a priority for the people that do hold power. Um, hold them accountable. Um, you know, there's always an opportunity for accountability um, outside of elections. So um, that's, that's what I would I'd encourage. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you all for an incredible engaging evening. Um, I think that all of these conversations we've had um, kind of prove that um, none of these solutions are black and white and we have to continue to have these challenging and engaging conversations um, to move forward. Um, so I hope that all of our um, audience members this evening will take these conversations, um, continue to have them in your communities. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for coming this evening. We truly appreciate hearing all of your input. Um, and yeah, I hope that everybody um, kind of does continue to have these conversations to move forward towards a brighter future for our birds, um, for all of our communities and just for the environment as a whole. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you.